Bible reading this morning is from Mark chapter 10, verse 32 to 45. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Heavenly Father, won't you help us now uh, come to your word with open hearts and minds. Um, may we understand through the power of your Holy Spirit what your word says and may we respond to your word in faith and obedience and we pray this for your glory. Amen. I have a song in mind as I think about Mark chapter uh, 8 through to Mark chapter 10. Here's a particular song that I have in mind and it's, it's not a Taylor Swift song if you were hoping for a Taylor Swift reference. It's actually a Lionel Richie song. Who's heard of Lionel Richie? <sighs> Great. Great singer. Beautiful love songs. Anyway, the song I have in mind is Once, Twice, Three Times a Lady. You know the song? Do you want me to sing it? Yeah. You're once, twice, three times a lady. And I love you. Got it? Anyway, there you go. Uh, now you got to get your husband to play it for you on whatever it is. Um, I know this is far from the text, but the reason I have that song in mind is because as you work through Mark chapter 8 and the second part of Mark chapter 8 through to Mark chapter 10, what you notice is not once, not twice, but three times Jesus predicts his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. Why is it so important? Because there are lots of people that see Jesus uh, as a wonderful influencer who had the most wonderful teaching, but it all went to pot when, of course, he was crucified and killed by the Romans. What followed, of course, is that the disciples were so distraught by the fact that this wonderful man who had such wonderful teaching was put to death by the Romans, crucified, that they historically came up with a story about his resurrection. That's how history goes. But that's not what the Bible actually says. The Bible says time and time again, not once, not twice, but three times, Jesus predicts before the event takes place, he predict, predicts his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. Let me remind you in Mark chapter 8 
and verse 31, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. In chapter 9, um, again in verse uh, 30, we read these words. They left the place and passed through Galilee, and Jesus uh, did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples and he said to them the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men they will kill him and after three days he will rise again and in mark chapter 10 uh, that was just read to us in verse uh, 42 um, we find these words Sorry, uh, 32, not 42. They were on their way up to Jerusalem uh, with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who were following were afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside and he told them what was going to happen to him. We are going to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. See it? Three times from Mark chapter 8 to Mark chapter 10, Jesus predicts exactly what's going to happen to him. He's going to suffer, he's going to die, and he's going to rise again. So that everybody would know that this is no coincidence, this is no accident, this is not a sad ending of the story of this remarkable man, Jesus. No, this is exactly what was prepared for him. This is exactly what was planned for Jesus. Why three times? Well, because if you've been reading and paying attention with me from Mark chapter 1 all the way through to Mark chapter 8, what do you notice about the disciples? Yeah, they are blind, stupid, and dumb. And so they need to be told again and again and again and again. And that's exactly what Jesus does. And you notice when you read those sections, the very words that follow on from there every single time is that the disciples are confused. They are confused about the resurrection. They are confused about the meaning of Jesus' death. They are confused about why this man, Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is declared to be the Messiah by Peter himself, why this man must suffer and die. And perhaps you can understand why they are so confused. Because of the title Jesus uses for himself, Jesus uses the title on numerous occasions, the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man must suffer these things, the Son of Man must die, the Son of Man must be raised from the dead. But what do you notice from the very first reading I gave you this morning as we started our service from Daniel chapter 7? That in Daniel chapter 7, the title, the Son of Man, speaks about a kingdom and a king who will reign for all eternity. And perhaps it's that that the disciples are battling with, trying to come to terms with. This man Jesus, who is the Messiah, the one who is sent from God, who is the son of man from da Daniel, how is it that this Jesus is speaking about suffering, dying, and rising? When in actual fact, the vision of Daniel is a glorious vision of the supremacy of Jesus, of his uh, rule that lasts for eternity. Perhaps that's what they're struggling with. Why does Jesus keep telling them? Well, we'll get to the point that Jesus wants to make about the meaning of his death. But the first point that Jesus wants to make to his disciples is that this is the way of the Messiah. And the way of the Messiah is the way of the cross. You cannot avoid it. So come back with me to chapter 8 and those passages and notice what Jesus says to his disciples after he has declared that he is about to suffer, die, and rise. In Mark chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus says, 
Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. In other words, Jesus is saying, this is the way of the Messiah. This is the way of the Son of God. This is the way of the Son of Man. He is to suffer, die. And if you are going to be my disciples, do you notice that in these three chapters, Jesus is more focused on speaking to his disciples than he is about speaking to the crowds? He's really getting in depth with his disciples now. He wants to teach them. He's not going to be any longer with them for a long period of time. He wants them to understand what it means for them to be a disciple of Jesus. And to be a disciple of Jesus, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. Look with me in chapter 9, after Jesus has again predicted his coming suffering and death. In verse 35, this is what he has to say. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. See what Jesus is doing? Jesus is talking about his path, his way, and he's saying, if you're going to be a follower of me, then your path, your way, the way you are to live, is a life where you deny yourself, where you take up your cross, where you follow me, where you are not first but last, and a servant of all. Again in chapter 10, after Jesus announced his death, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, notice again in verse 42 to verse 45 what he says to his disciples. Verse 42, Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers in the Gentile lord it over them, and, that, that, uh, and their higher officials exercise authority over them, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. You see what Jesus is doing? By Jesus declaring that he is the suffering servant, he is setting a foundation for his disciples to follow his pattern of life. And his pattern of life is a life of self-denial, a life of taking up your cross, a life of not being first but last, a life of being a slave to all. Who's signing up? Do you see? This is so counterintuitive in relation to the culture of the first century. Not just the culture of the first century, but the culture of our 21st century. You'd never measure greatness. You never me measure success. You never measure any of those through the eyes of servanthood through the eyes of slavery, through the eyes of self-denial. Do you see it? A great leader is someone who defeats their enemy. A great leader is someone who is majestic and powerful and answers to nobody. A great human being is someone who is successful and achieves and is not a servant of anybody. They run their own course, make their own way. Jesus actually says, no, no, no. He turns it on its head. 
And he says to you and me, for us to be his disciples, we are to serve. We're to put others before ourselves. We are to be slaves to one another. Jesus is the suffering servant and the reason he is the suffering servant is so that he might set the example for his disciples to follow. Greatness is actually seen in you losing yourself. Greatness is actually seen in you putting yourself last. Greatness is actually seen in you being a servant of all, a slave to all. That's where true greatness is found. It's quite remarkable, isn't it? It's quite challenging. That's why kind of a key text in all of Mark is verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve. Sorry, what? For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Thanks, Margaret. So let me express it in another way, just in case you're struggling to get it. In Philippians chapter 2, here's what chapter 2 says. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any communion sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness or compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, valuing others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant by being made in human likeness and by being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? It means to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. It means to put yourself last. It means for you to be a servant of all, actually a slave to all. How's this possible, you ask? Because if you and I choose to live that way, undoubtedly there are going to be people that are going to take advantage of us, right? We live that way because Jesus is not only the servant, the suffering servant, but because Jesus is the suffering saviour. Look again at verse 45 of chapter 10. 
For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here's what the disciples had to come to terms with as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, that this Messiah, this Son of Man, is also the man who is spoken about in Isaiah chapter 53. Should I say Isaiah 52? My Michael was in the wrong place. No, Isaiah 53. What am I talking about? Isaiah 53. Can I read it to you? Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their face, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took upon, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. We, had, we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own ways and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the man Jesus the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the Son of Man. Who is he? He's the suffering servant. And he calls you and me to follow in his footsteps as servants. Why? Because he's the suffering saviour. that has redeemed you and me. And because we are redeemed, we can give our lives to the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can deny ourselves. We can take up our cross and we can follow Jesus. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in your mercy, and your kindness you sent us your son Jesus we thank you for the example that he sets for us we thank you that he calls us to true true, true greatness and greatness is seen in us giving up our lives serving others being a slave to all for that's what he did for us. But more than just setting us an example, Father, he rescued us from sin and death and final judgment that we might stand with him one day in glory. Please won't you help us to be faithful servants of one another and faithful disciples of Jesus. We pray this for your glory and in your son's name. Amen.